200 years ago, the buffalo or American bison roamed the Great Plains of North America. It was probably the most populous land animal in the planet at the time, and herds could number into the millions. The Native Americans were entirely dependent for their livelihood on this buffalo. They would obviously eat the meat for food. They would use the hides for clothing and to make tents for shelter. They would use the tendons as bowstrings. They would burn the dung for fuel. They would boil the bones and the hooves for glue. Everything of the buffalo was used. Nothing was wasted. And everything was needed. And so when the American government decided to eradicate the Indian, the strategy they chose to do this with was to eliminate the buffalo with terrifying success. Within a couple of decades, there were two tiny herds of buffalo left, counting about 2,000 heads each, living on reservations. And the Indian? The Indian went the way of the buffalo, living in reservations, their way of life lost forever. If you fast forward to the here and now, and you look around you, and we heard Pierre Vellinger say something about some of the stuff we're doing to our planet earlier today. We're kind of going the way of the buffalo ourselves. With climate change, with all of the minerals and fossil fuels we're extracting from the planet, at the same time, a double whammy of we're cutting down all the rainforests that are the lungs of this planet. If you look at the amount of poverty throughout the world, more than one billion people living under the absolute poverty line, scraping by for food each day. It doesn't really take a rocket scientist to figure out that this isn't going to last. In fact, anyone that thinks that infinite growth is possible on a finite planet must either be confused or an economist. And while we laugh, our world is really actually quite literally going to hell in a handbasket. We are addicted to growth. We're addicted to faster, to cheaper, to more. This week, the new iPhone gets launched and tens of thousands, if not millions of people around the planet will hand in the perfectly fine iPhone 5 for the new iPhone 5S. Why? We're addicted to more and it's destroying our world. We're not trying to kill an Indian. Because we are the Indians. That would be pretty stupid. We actually don't really seem to care. That's even more stupid. We're stuck. We're addicted to faster, to cheaper, and more. At the core of this whole system, we have lost the idea, which is probably one of the most valuable core basics of being a human, is that the most important things in life aren't things, but still everything around us is dictated by things. Government's main metric is the gross domestic product, which is based on things. Large multinational corporations, eventually they measure their success by the annual return to stockholders. But we have lost the fact that the most important things in life aren't things. Then why are we running the world as if they were? You don't need to be a rocket scientist to realize this is not going to last forever. All you have to do is open up any history book and you will see every system fails eventually from the ancient Romans through to the Mayans and through to the people at Easter Island. All systems that failed because they went so far over the boundaries of what they could actually sustainably do that they totally imploded. But if you also look in those same history books, you see that it's not implosion that is the only option. You can see that time and time again, people stood up and they said, it does not have to be this way. And they would push over the world that they would see at that moment. And they would create space for a new world, from the storming of the Bastille to the, na to the nailing of a whole bunch of theses on the doors of a church in Wittenberg almost 500 years ago. You see that change is not only a possibility, it has been a reality throughout the history of mankind. For the first decade of my life, I lived under the dark cloud of the Cold War and the potential nuclear bomb that would come and wipe us out in Armageddon. And on my 11th birthday, everyone seemed to be happy. Smiles all over. I thought it was because it was my birthday, but it was the day the Berlin Wall fell. How did that Berlin Wall fall? Well, a little while before that, there were some people in Eastern Europe that says, this cannot last. And so they did what any revolutionary does. They organized a picnic. They put a picnic right next to the Iron Curtain, and there was one very brave man that took a bunch of wire cutters with him. And he walked up to that fence, which was even braver, and he started snipping through the wires. There were soldiers all around. They were terrified, but they refused to shoot. 
They did not shoot. This man kept snipping. They kept not shooting. By this time, there was a bunch of people standing around him. And once he had actually gotten a hole in this iron curtain, he did the bravest thing he could have done. He stepped through. And still, the soldiers didn't shoot. And after this brave man went through, more people went through. And more people went through. And within a couple of hours, thousands of people had crossed the Iron Curtain. Just a few short weeks later, the Berlin Wall fell. And something that many of us still experience that we probably never would have thought would end, ended quicker than anyone could possibly have imagined. Change is possible. The question isn't if this system will fall. The question really isn't even when. Because we are running out of things so fast that most of us will live to see that day. The question really, really is how. And here's how. The change. A hopeful, bright new world is starting to grow through the cracks of the breaking world around us. I see it all around me, from urban gardening in the big cities, to people starting to try to get back to local economies, to people actually caring about what they buy, to the upcoming of the fair trade movement, as well as the critique on the fair trade movement to actually get things done right, are all over. Everywhere you see, you can see the cracks starting to take place for a slower, for a fairer for a better world instead of a faster, a cheaper, a more world. A world where we actually start redefining the definitions of wealth and growth. Where we start looking at how can we distribute these new definitions of wealth and growth and prosperity in a way that actually is fair to the entire world. And where we actually start building transparency so that the powers that be, whether they are governments, multinational corporations, or powerful individuals, actually are held accountable to their deeds for everyone on this planet. And not just on the big level, but also on the small level, because it's going to cost us. We cannot expect to live faster and cheaper and more if we want a slower and a better and a fairer world. We ourselves are just going to have to get better. St. Augustine of Hippo, one of the church fathers, once said that hope has two beautiful daughters, anger and courage. Anger at the way things are and courage to see that they do not remain the way they are. So if the question is not if this world will fall, if the question is not when, because most of us will live to see that day, if the question is how, then it's up to us to get up to the Iron Curtain and to snip through our Iron Curtains. It's up to us to see a change. And it's very, very simple. We need to start finding our own Bastilles to storm up the barricades. We need to take the sledgehammers to our own Berlin walls of, I don't know, shall we call it greed? Shall we call it not really caring about the future, but living in the here and now and speed? We need to start taking our sledgehammers to our Berlin walls. We need to start nailing our theses to the doors of the 21st century Wittenberg churches. It can be done because it has been done before. And I think that we can do it again if we all step out with hope on our tongues, anger in one hand, and courage in the other. Thank you.